Um, I'm Joe Lombardo. I'm the coordinator of UNAC, the United National Anti-War Coalition here in the US. Um, and as you know, there is a G7, a group of seven nations summit that's taking place in, of all places, Hiroshima, Japan. The United States, the leader of the world capitalist nations and the leader of the G7, the only country that ever dropped a nuclear bomb on people, did it in Hiroshima. And um, then after seeing the terrible destruction that it did, a couple of days later, they did it again on Nagasaki. Um, one of the most criminal acts, perhaps the most criminal act that ever took place in the history of humankind. Hundreds of thousands were killed. And that is where they choose to hold this meeting. This meeting is a meeting to come together to build more war. Um, <clears throat> they've already decided that they will give more weapons and money for the war in Ukraine, including, as I heard on the news today, F-16 jets. They also are talking about further tightening their um, uh, hold around the surrounding of uh, China. Um, and it is all part of their buildup of military forces uh, in, in Asia. Um, what we're doing today is part of solidarity actions with the people in the streets um, of Japan that are protesting the uh, G7 meeting. At the end, we're gonna try something. Um, uh, there's too many people for everybody to be seen on the screen, but we'll see a lot of you. So I'm gonna ask while we're doing the webinar, if you'd all get a piece of paper and on that piece of paper, you write down one of the slogans of the demonstrations that are being held in in um, uh, in um, here, in Japan right now, and we can have a visual effect of that. Um, have some pictures of it, and uh, we can get it out to people and show it around the world. Um, this webinar is being recorded, and if you registered, and so everybody that's hearing me has registered. Um, uh, you will get 24 hours after the webinar, you will get um, a message from Zoom. Don't just throw it out, open it up because on there will be the link to the video of this webinar and you can get it around, use it um, as you see fit. And I wonder if Cody, if you would put into the, um, uh, into the chat, the slogans that um, people can write. Oh, you got it there. They say junk G7, US out of Asia Pacific and the build up to war. So if you guys could get some paper and write one of those or two of those slogans on the paper at the very end of the webinar, we'll hold it up and we'll have a visual protest that we all participated in. Um, I'm gonna start by introducing uh, um, Cody, Cody Urban, he's from uh, Resist US-led war, war movement. Um, and he's in Japan right now. He's from the United States and he's going to be our first speaker. I do wanna mention one other thing before we start though. I do wanna mention two other things before Cody speaks. First of all, um, you can um, find out more about UNAC uh, by going to our website, which is unacpeace.org, or viewing us on YouTube, which is at UNAC, or Instagram, which is at UNAC Peace, or on Facebook, or at End the Wars, and on Twitter, we're at at UNAC One. And um, so if you'd like to see more about uh, UNAC, you can do that. The other thing I'm going to mention is while these democracies, so-called seven great democracies are meeting in Japan. They did what they could to try to prevent people from protesting their actions. And that included um, 
keeping people out of the country who came. Uh, one of them is Carly, who is on the call here. She's now back in the United States. She was not allowed into the country. Another um, person was not allowed in, who was a member of the UNAC Administrative Committee. Um, and we'll be talking more about them, and, and Carly will be talking about her experience. So back to Cody. Cody, you're up. Great. Thank you so much, Joe. I'm going to start my timer to make sure I don't go too long. Um, and thank you, everyone, so much for coming on today. Uh, I want to really thank UNEC for giving us this platform uh, while we're here in Japan, um, you know, joining the thousands, thousands of people who are saying no to G7, who are working to, you know, actually expose what this alliance of the most richest and powerful and honestly the most dangerous countries in the world right now um, are doing, um, which, you know, those of, those of us will also speak uh, more on different aspects of the G7 and why we're here. Um, but I wanted to give maybe just a, a intro over the context. So what is the context to today's uh, G7 summit? And why Japan? Not just Japan, but why the whole Asia Pacific region as a whole? Um, and it comes down to how many words is this? One, two, three, four, five. just a few words. A free and open Indo Pacific. These are very calculatedly planned words a free and open Indo Pacific that come from the US Indo Pacific Command strategy. That's the command, the US military command that's based in the Indo-Pacific region. These few words have been that really, I think it's it goes back to 2012 when you know, they started to solidify this, the US military. These few words were the first, almost like the first firing shot of a bold new strategy that the US decided to take on that they called the pivot to Asia. And that was go looking back at where all the U.S. military was all around the world and saying right now, you know, despite everything after the Cold War, when the U.S. comes out seemingly as the number one only major imperialist power like in the world and can do whatever they want, like carpet bomb different parts of the former Yugoslavia, carpet bomb and invade Iraq nu numerous times the 20 year occupation of Afghanistan, the destruction of Libya, um, all of this seemed the US seemed thought it could do totally unchecked until it realized that now there are other major competitors rising that could change the face of US imperial, the strategy of US imperialism going forward. And the number one so-called enemy that the United States told us they need to folk, we need to focus on is China. And that's what gave this, these words, a free and open Indo-Pacific to say, this is what the US is going to protect. Um, China is somehow making things not free or not open. And so the US's actions in its Indo-Pacific strategy um, have pushed it and now other countries, other G7 countries who are rewriting just in the last year, rewriting their military strategies to say, we are going to fight for a free and open Indo-Pacific. But what does that look like? So I'm going to share my screen and just put up a series of these two maps. These are two of the most consequential maps to consider right now, as we're here in Japan, and as all this new military um, uh, spending is being promised for this region. So the first thing to keep note of is another term that the U.S. uses. This is the map on the left that it's called the um, island chain strategy. What this means is that the U.S. has considered, has laid down what they call a first island chain and a second island chain. Now, the first, uh, these are so-called chains, are lines drawn in a map of where the front line of offense is against China, uh, North Korea falls into that target list as well. And it goes, as you can see, 
um, starting from the west, the northwest coast of Borneo, up through the west coast of the Philippines, and coming up in the north, it goes down Japan, down the Ryukyu Arc. That's the series of islands that come down south and go through Ryukyu Island, also known as Okinawa. And it both of these come down in the middle, right in Taiwan, which is another country we've heard a lot in the U.S. news about right now. So what does this mean? It means what we're seeing on the right, a massive, massive buildup of U.S. and other U.S. allied militarization in this area that we've that's unprecedented. It's literally unprecedented. The U.S. has 60 percent of its overseas troops here in Asia Pacific. Um, in the in the Philippines, what this looks like is on where you see that line going up through the Philippines, what was just opened along those areas of that line that is Palawan and Northern Luzon is four new Philippine military bases that were just uh, open to US troops to use on a permanent basis. Um, this is actually technically illegal. This is uh, based on a, a Senate a uh, Senate vote that voted the U.S. bases out of the Philippines because of massive outcry and organizing by the majority of Philippine people in 1992. It also means that in Okinawa, uh, which by the way, Japan, where we are right now, has the largest number of overseas military operations, uh, installations than any other country outside the U.S. It has over 130 official ones but, you know, from one from a base that has multiple square miles to an office building in somewhere, it could be it could be thousands that we don't know about. Um, but Okinawa has the vast majority of these in Okinawa, about 90 percent of, of citizens in Okinawa actually live near U.S. military bases and there are protests every day. I mean, e from even if it's just a, a handful of people people are protesting the US military presence in Okinawa every single day. And just recently, the Japanese government allowed for US Marines be to train on beach landing exercises on Southern islands that are, that are less than a hundred miles away from Taiwan. You can see Taiwan from the distance. Now, I wanna say something that I just learned, that I just talked to someone with yesterday as we were on the train to Hiroshima to join the first day of protests. There were two comrades of ours from Taiwan and I was talking to them and saying, hey, just in, in the US back at home, I hear about how dangerous China is to Taiwan all the time. It says the Taiwanese people are terrified of China. They're, they want independence because they could be invaded by China and that the US arming Taiwan is the only way to save the people. And these, these comrades from Taiwan are like, that is not true. They said, we're Chinese, <laughs> you know? Like we, this is, we're part of the same people. It's, it's the US that's been pushing that Taiwan passed a new national security law that is cracking down on people talking about, you know, peaceful reunification. Um, that was after the US visited, you know, this, don't believe anything they're saying. So I really have to emphasize for people in the U.S. this is a lie. And we're, I was told this by people from Taiwan yesterday who were saying, please stop this U.S. build up to war. This is that would what was what would build up to World War Three. And I only have a couple minutes before I want to pass it off. But on the map on the right, what you can see is a huge I just want to name a few things you see here. We're seeing nuclear submarines that are about to be based in Australia. This is because of a new deal called AUKUS between, the, between Australia, the UK, and the US. Australia has never had US nu nuclear submarines stationed there. Um, South Korea, there was just uh, the South Korean president, Yoon Suk Yeol, just recently visited um, the White House in which Biden promised nuclear submarines to be based in South Korea. This is the first time this will happen in 40 years. Again, this is unprecedented and just in the last few months. All of this has been just in the last few months. And then also the US, Japan, and South Korea have had multiple joint military exercises where they actually practice what it would look like to invade North Korea. They have, at, they have had drills of invasions of North Korea on South Korean soil. So when the US is saying that China and North Korea and Russia and all these other countries are a danger to a quote, free and open Indo-Pacific. 
we have to see what's really going on here. This is the justification for war. The United States has already decided it's going to go to war with China. What it's trying to get us to do now and what this G7 summit in Japan is about is it's trying to get us to agree with them. It's trying to get us to decide we need to go to war with China. We have to do everything we can to say that that is not what the people of the US, what the people of Japan, what the people of the world want. We have to fight back against the narrative. And that's why we're here protesting the G7. And I think that's my time and I'll pass it off. Great. Thank, thank you, Cody. Um, I just want to mention that if you have questions, we're going to have short statements by all the speakers. And if you have questions, um, you can put them in the question and answer area on the bottom of your screen. There's an icon with Q&A, and that's the place to put them, because if you put them in the general chat, they'll just scroll up and we won't see them. And I also notice that we have another participant who's Rhonda Romero. Um, uh, so I don't know if she'll be able to just listen or speak or what, but uh, um, she, uh, Carly will tell you her story when, she's, when, she, when she speaks. Um, our next speaker is going to be uh, Rosario Bella Guzman, and she's from uh, Iban Foundation. Um, Rosario. Thank you very much, Joe. Good morning from Japan to all of you. Ibon is a Philippine-based research organization. Uh, we, we are also, we share history with Ibon International, if you're more familiar with that. Um, actually, what we are seeing here is that underneath the U.S. growing militarism are G7's aggressive economic interests. The G7 countries are seeking to overcome the long-standing global recession that they are not recognizing. And what is not being said is that the crisis of global capitalism has only reasserted itself with more vigor, even as economies had reopened after the pandemic. Um, the world economy is facing financial distress and disrupted supply chains, which are being addressed by further expansion of capital, greater debt, and the reorganization of supply chains through intensified protectionism. But we all know that these conventional solutions only serve to deepen the imperialist crisis as they do not um, address the root, which is the crisis of overproduction. So they have only heightened the degree of financialization of the economy. For instance, um, right now, the assets of global financial institutions are equivalent to 501% of the global GDP, which means that there are more financial assets going around the world economy, more than economic production. On the other hand, global debt is about 351% of GDP, which <clears throat> means that the world produces um, more debt <laughs> than, uh, than commodities or products for our use. The reality also is that global trade investments are slowing, if not flattening out. The World Bank recently projected a 1.7% growth of the global economy in 2023, which will be the lowest in 40 years. So this crisis has manifested itself rather too soon after reopening um, in record high food and energy inflation, uh, which uh, the US, for instance, has only addressed with higher interest rates which is a non-solution because, um, yes, it's presumably to temper aggregate demand and contain inflation, but eventually that kind of move will strangle economic production. And that is what is happening, especially in the global South. The G7 relies on these um, accustomed approaches. Um, as, as, it con as it continues to do so, it is inevitable, therefore, that before the decade ends, the world economy is diving into a recession that is going to be even deeper than what has been started in 2008. And the G7 countries with their militarist agenda cannot hope to reverse that. Um, actually, what they're doing is that the G7 countries are abandoning their globalization rhetoric 
and reshoring their global investments. So they are um, ramping up protectionism and support, especially for domestic high technology, digital and industrial sectors by giving lavish subsidies, tariffs, um, or uh, increasing tariffs, local content rules, domestic production targets, export restrictions, investment controls, and increasing sanctions on the use of intellectual property rights. They want to control semiconductors, artificial intelligence, renewables, and other climate technologies. Food and health are also basic weapons of imperialist control. And the US, as already mentioned, has always identified China as the sole competitor to this control. And China has long been protectionist, which makes its rise steady and expansive, propelling its high uh, technology sector to be a large part of its uh, GDP. Um, for instance, China accounts for 60% of global rare earth mine production and 85% of rare earth processing capacity. And it can use this for green technologies and as negotiating leverage in global trade and investment. So uh, the Trump administration started a trade war with China even before the pandemic, but it is now escalating a chips war where it is imposing chips embargo to China, specifically uh, sanctioning China's use of US IPR. And the impact of this war on both sides will be devastating. Before coming to Hiroshima, the, uh, uh, the countries were tackling development finance as they converge in Hiroshima and their particular focus is on infrastructure investment. And, and, and this is another attempt to contain what China has started with its Belt and Road Initiative to counter and eventually offset China. The G7 has launched a global partnership for infrastructure investment. Um, which is a $600 billion funding initiative to spearhead infrastructure projects in the global south. Uh, but it will be mainly by the private sector and in four areas, namely digital connectivity, climate and energy security, healthcare and gender equality. But the aggressive aims are apparent. Though. There are These are mainly to shore up alliances in the global south in order to support the reordering of supply chains. Um, there are two harsh realities that uh, we can share in this uh, forum right now, why the G7 countries are carrying out their economic interests not in congruence with the harsh realities of the global economy. One is that the financial um, distress is undeniable. So the spending target, for instance, for this infrastructure investment is, eat, um, is uh, there is no concrete plan the G7 is yet to unveil a concrete plan where it will get the funds. And uh, right now, the U.S. is edging closer to a debt default, while a bank crisis is getting more and more apparent with the recent collapse of the First Republic Bank and subsequent takeover by J.P. Morgan. The U.S. government bailout of the Silicon Valley Bank, the second biggest failure, bank failure in U.S. history, the takeover of Credit Suisse, by UBS with Swiss government guarantees. And, and there is also, we're, we're seeing a slide of the shares value of Deutsche Bank of Germany. And these heightened fears over the instability of the banking sector, which prompts the G7 to focus on the resilience, not only of supply chains, but of the financial system itself. And this is where the role of Japan becomes apparent. Japan is the largest source of official development assistance in the region which it has historically used as an instrument to open up economies of the Association of the Southeast Asian Nations. And um, ODA are mostly loans with concessional rates, yes, but with neoliberal policies attached as conditionalities. So in recent years, Japan ODA has been emphasizing the need for, for the global value chain approach as key to development. And this is quite useful now for the reordering of supply chains for G7 sole benefit. The other reality is that the people in the global South are suffering from fuel and food inflation, poor government pandemic response, increasing employment precariousness and worsening poverty. So the infrastructure, if only to improve global supply chains and sustain profits of transnational corporations and their local counterparts, 
is not the priority, should not be the priority at the moment. But what the G7 offers as development finance will only benefit the domestic economic oligarchs and their partner TNCs, as well as commissioning government officials. The increasing debts of the underdeveloped countries have already ushered them in an uncertain period of austerity where more debts and more taxes burden the people while social services and protection are being cut. What the G7 wants and the manner it exacts these are untenable and are only bound to hurt the majority of the world's population. Thus, these vested interests can only vested economic interests can only be pursued through relentless U.S. warmongering and militarism. But um, as we say, and also as, as we conclude our protest here in Japan, we're saying that, but even that is a paper tiger because people around the world are rising up with more vigorous struggles and resistance against imperialism and war. And Hiroshima, after all, has taught a valuable and forgettable lesson. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosario. Um, our next speaker is going to be um, Yoshio Nakumia. I hope I pronounced that somewhat close to what it is, uh, Yoshio. Um, uh, he is um, from the Asian-wide uh, campaign against US-Japanese domination and aggression in Asia, uh, Yoshio. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Yoshio Nakamura, a secretariat of Asia Wide Campaign Japan. The name of my organization is formally the uh, Asian Wide Campaign Against uh, US Japanese Domination and Aggression of Asia. It is a people's organization against war, uh, military bases, and neoliberal policies. Uh, uh, yesterday, we, uh, we, we held a demonstration in central Hiroshima city, along with other organizations and concerned in individuals to show our steadfast protest to the G7 summit meeting in there. there. And then uh, we will hold a march in Hiroshima again on this afternoon. So now the, yeah, you can... Uh, you, you can show our protest yesterday. So uh, why uh, we protest the G7, G7 summit meeting? Uh, because the, the G7 summit meeting, and um, especially the Hiroshima summit on this year, uh, will expand war and military tension in East Asia and the world. Uh, this is our major reason to protest the G7 meeting in Hiroshima. Um, I got the news yesterday that uh, Ukraine President Zelensky and decided to attend the summit meeting directly uh, in response to invitation from the G7 leaders. The U uh, United States and NATO countries are prolonging the war on war on Ukraine because it is a war related to hegemony of the Western imperialism in the world. Uh, they are providing huge amount of military aid to Ukraine, uh, which serves the interest of the military and um, military industrial complex of their countries. Uh, Japanese government also provides aid to Ukraine through NATO funds. Uh, well, we believe that uh, G7 leaders are just our uh, warmongers. Uh, in East Asia, uh, militant, uh, military tension is also, is also rising. It has been brought about by the US Japanese imperialist uh, strategy of China, of China containment, or uh, so, the so called free and open in the Pacific strategy. So that's uh, Cody uh, mentions. In fact, the U.S. Biden, uh, the U.S. Biden administration has strengthened its military alliance with uh, allied uh, with allied countries in uh, East uh, in, uh, in in East Asia like Japan, South Korea, Australia, and the Philippines. It, it has uh, repeatedly held joint military exercises. Uh, 
with those country forces in different area, in different area in the region and simultaneously. Uh, as a new, a new security frameworks such as the Quad or, or, and the AUKUS have, have, have also been created in the region. In addition now, uh, the US, Japan, South Korea, Triangle Military Co uh, Coordination is rapid, uh, rapidly uh, developing over uh, tension of Korean Peninsula. Uh, at the same time, so I want to mention about Japan, Japanese own uh, military building up. The Kishida administration announced the new Japanese security strategy last December 2022. Uh, it, will, it will further promote the US-Japan military uh, alliance and so reinforcement of the US uh, bases in Japan. At the, at the same time, the, gov the Japanese government tried to uh, dramatic, uh, dramatically uh, increase the, the Japanese own offensive, capab offensive capabilities of the Jap uh, self-defense forces through the position of an enemy base attack capability. Uh, it is a clear shift from uh, past so-called defense-only policies. The Kishida administration has also decided double increase of the military spending over the next five years. In, in, in addition, the uh, Japanese government is now building and reinforcing the its, uh, Japanese self-defense forces missile bases in different islands in Okinawa, which are leading military tension over the Taiwan Strait. I also want to mention about the G7 um, leaders visiting to Atomic Bomb Museum yesterday. Uh, but Biden um, visits the uh, uh, Bomb Museum, uh, bringing the US nuclear bombs. And they visited, uh, the G7 leaders uh, visited the, there yes, uh, just for 40 minutes. But uh, Ordinary people and uh, tourists uh, cannot enter the museum or the Peace Memorial Park during the um, period of the, the G7 summit held it. Um, uh, uh, held, uh, held it. So, uh, as we know, well, the US atomic bombing on Hiroshima and Nagasaki killed more than uh, 200,000 uh, 200, people instantly or as a, by the end of the 1945. It's a crime against humanity. A suffering of the survivors and their descendants continue until today. But the US administration, including Biden, I have never apologized for it. For the G7 leaders, uh, especially the uh, US, the UK, and France, uh, as uh, nuclear powers, uh, the visit of the a bomb museum or Hiroshima Peace Park is just a ceremony. They don't ever intend to stop the nuclear uh, the nuclear armament. And also the Japanese government uh, uh, and regarding the Japanese government, Prime Minister Kishida often say he passed that the world without nukes, but uh, Japanese government has not ratified even the treaty on the prohibition of the nuclear weapons because the Japanese government want to keep want to keep the U.S. nuclear umbrella of Japan. I uh, I believe only the people and and and, and the uh, only the people and the unity and struggle can stop world life and still uh, your drive. So, uh, we, uh, so we hold the protest in Hiroshima yesterday and then hold, uh, we hold uh, again tomorrow, uh, this afternoon to show our own, uh, to show our people's voice against imperialist, imperialist war drives. So, 
So Jam G7 and the Long Live International Solidarity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yoshio. Um, I just want to remind people, if you have questions, put them in the question and answer area. You can see the little Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, at the uh, end, I'm going to try to turn everybody's screens on so that we will all be seen in one big screen. And hopefully, you'll hold up your message um, of uh, solidarity with the people protesting the G7 meeting going on in, in Japan. Um, I'll put again some of the slogans that uh, the protests are being organized around, and you can put one of those on a sign, and hopefully we can show that and then send that around as our solidarity with the folks protesting the G7. Um, our final speaker before we go into questions and discussion is um, Carly, who's um, unfortunately, Carly, you're going to have to, Carly Brook is your last name. I didn't have it written down. I'm very sorry, even though Carly, we, and I, I know Carly. Um, she is uh, also with Resist US-led Wars. Um, and she's going to tell you a little bit about her story of these um, going to Japan to protest and what happened to her um, by these so-called democracies that uh, are meeting in, in Hiroshima right now. Carly, I'm turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, and I wish I could be there with everybody uh, in Japan. Um, Basbi Cody and Nakamura-san. Um, I'm uh, um, proud of the efforts and seeing the pictures is really heartening um, of the, the actions that were able to be conducted in Hiroshima. Um, my name is Carly Brook and I'm also a member of the Global Secretariat of the Resist US-led War Movement. Um, and as, as people have mentioned, um, as members of the International People's Front, um, RESIST, ILPS, IBON, uh, APRN, and others um, have been waging a campaign since the beginning of the year to expose, confront, and junk the G7. Um, this week is the peak of our campaign um, to conduct our peace summit, to oppose the G7, and to conduct the protest actions in Hiroshima um, yesterday and today. Um, I plan to attend the People's Summit um, and uh, continue to be a part of the protests um, against the G7. But upon my arrival to the Haneda airport in Tokyo, um, I was immediately pulled aside by the Japanese uh, customs and immigration authorities, um, pulled into a private um, interview and uh, questioned by um, more than eight different immigration and customs officers. Um, they uh, confiscated my passport um, and my phone and um, asked questions about where I would be traveling, uh, my occupation, where I'd be staying, planned activities, uh, if I was traveling alone, if I paid my own way to Japan, um, what other countries I visited, um, and um, what my purpose was being in Japan, particularly in this time period. Um, and during the entire um, period of questioning, um, where they didn't allow any recording photographs um, or uh, even a phone call to an attorney um, or a contact, um, the officers had in front of them a paper in Japanese, so I couldn't read most of it, but it did have several words in English including the words uh, NATO, G7, and International People's Front. Um, so um, I was already aware that this was not a random, um, random search or interview process, but more so um, targeting those of us intending to go and express our dissent against the G7. Um, so they continued to search um, 
my person and all my belongings. Um, they found a few uh, protest flyers from an action in the US in um, calling for justice for Pushan Brown, an Amazon worker who died during the COVID, COVID pandemic um, that her sister made and they poured over it, they took pictures of it um, and asked, why would you have this? Why would you distribute this? And it was actually just from a protest in the US, I'd forgotten to take it out of my backpack, but they were looking for anything that they could find to prove that they, um, that they didn't want activists to enter uh, Japan at this time. Um, and so after the questioning and interviews um, and search, they presented me with a formal exclusion order um, in accordance with uh, their Immigration Control and Refugee Act, Re Refugee Recognition Act, that informed me that I would not be allowed to enter Japan um, and that I'd have to wait in uh, immigration facilities until I could return to the US. Um, so it was already very late at night by the time um, they handed my passport directly to the flight attendants of the next flight I would be boarding and didn't return it back to me until um, I was uh, repatriated back uh, to Los Angeles. Um, and as I'm reflecting upon this experience, um, I know that many people experience this kind of violence on the daily, at borders, at airports, um, um, and that citizenship or um, these, these mechanisms are used to, to criminalize many millions of people. Um, and I know also that as an activist and anti-war organizer that um, these increased surveillance and security measures, including um, their quote, period for special reinforcements for landing examinations um, during the G7 in Hiroshima and the ministerial meetings there are um, intentional and that they serve the interests of the imperialist ruling class of the US um, and then the allies of the US throughout the G7 bloc. Um, so we continue to denounce this political repression against activists. Um, we can say very plainly that Japan um, denied entry um, to activists because our people struggle and all struggle that exposes the bankrupt agendas of the G7 um, is effective. And it people struggle threatens their narrative that the G7 is indomitable. Um, we know that they use immigration and customs um, law to suppress dissent especially those uh, inside and outside the G7 countries who are opposed to the rise of militarization and the buildup to war. And it really shows how undemocratic Japan truly is. And as it continues to get worse following the process of remilitarization of Japan and the increased um, offensive capabilities of the Japanese military and ongoing base expansion in the region, um, and this, this looks very similar to the way that the US is becoming increasingly undemocratic, um, militarized, um, and cultivating a sphere of influence and support um, across the Asia Pacific. Um, we know that um, the type of policies that are being uh, united on inside the closed doors of the G7 summit um, will continue to suppress the voices of people who oppose uh, the interests of US imperialism, who oppose the corporate and warmongering agenda of the US. Um, and those protesting inside the countries um, like Japan that continue to serve US imperialism as partners in Asia Pacific. So it's uh, of course disappointing. <laughs> um, not to be there, but we um, shouldn't be surprised that um, that in this context, it's it's really the people, it's really um, voices of dissent, it's voices of criticism that are excluded from the decision making of the G seven. Um, but it's also the people who are um, most affected by the devastating impacts of the policies being negotiated there. So no matter what risks we face, um, 
no matter what attempts to silence us, um, we need to continue to raise our voices. Um, and that's what this moment of crisis created by the G7 itself um, calls on us to do. So um, I'm um, with you in solidarity in Japan um, as you continue to protest. Um, I hope you'll raise your fists and flags and banners for me. Um, and we'll continue to see people all around the world um, unite against the G7, um, continue to fight imperialist wars and struggle for just peace. Um, so I'll raise our calls here um, to stop political repression, to defend people's struggle, uh, to get the US out of Asia Pacific and the build up to war, uh, no to Japanese militarism and to junk the G7. Thank you. Thank you, Carly. Um, I just put the slogans that we can hold up at the end again in the chat. So I hope everybody could see that and we'll be put, uh, getting um, their signs ready so that we can hold them up together. Uh, Carly's presentation, you know, on the repression that we're seeing um, in the United States from the US allies and the G7, all around the world is increasing. It's increasing as the US hegemony is being challenged, as uh, the war in Ukraine is not going the way that they wanted it to be. And so we see it in the United States very clearly. We still see that they want to still imprison Julian Assange for 175 years for um, uh, showing that uh, war crimes um, that U.S. committed war crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, Daniel Hale, who was a young man who was involved in the drone program in Afghanistan, um, reported to the world that uh, the drones were mainly hitting civilians, not military targets. And that apparently was confidential information. And so for, expo for telling confidential information, he was put in jail for four years. Um, our friends from the um, African People's Socialist Party were having a different narrative, a clear narrative against uh, US policy in Ukraine, the expansion of NATO, um, have been accused of spreading Russian propaganda and they have been indicted. Um, two uh, reporters from Germany and one from Britain, who had the audacity to go to the Donbass and see the fighting that's going on there from the other side and the bombing that's happening of civilians in the Donbass, um, they have been sanctioned, like the like countries like countries get sanctioned and individuals get sanctioned. So their own countries, Germany and Britain, have sanctioned these three people. And their sanctions are they froze their bank accounts. They took their money and, and they, they uh, just took whatever ever they had. So these are the kinds of things that we're going to face more and more um, as we enter into this real, real danger, dangerous period. And so, you know, I, I agree with what Carly said. I wish I could be there in Japan, and I'm not. Well, I understand some of my words were met, were were shown at the uh, uh, um, alternative summit that was happening that was happening there, um, but we all in this um, webinar express our solidarity with the folks that are there, um, and uh, we'll do that again at the end when we hold up our signs. So uh, everybody will I, I will move it so that everybody can be seen on the screen when that happens, uh, when that time happens. But let's get into some questions um, and see what, um, uh, see what uh, people here have to say about it. Um, uh, one question was, what percentage of the protests were actually Japanese folks and what were from outside? And we saw some pictures of the protests, but as I understand it, there were actually protests that were 
um, scattered all throughout the city that was taking place. Maybe some of the folks that were there and will be attending further protests today. Um, it's, it's seven or eight o'clock in the morning or nine o'clock in the morning in Japan right now. Uh, can talk a little bit about those protests. So um, whoever would like to take that, please uh, unmute yourself and do so. Any takers on the protests and how they're going, what they look like? Well, okay. I don't think we're getting, we're getting a lot of response. Um, so oh, ho hopefully, okay. Uh, oh, sorry, yes, uh, um, uh, I, yeah, I, I forget the question. Uh, yeah. The protests that happened um, today and uh, yesterday, or will happen today and happened yesterday, you know, can you just tell us a little bit about them? And we understand that there were a number of protests all throughout the city. They were scattered. They hadn't come together um, at any one point. Is that is that the case? And what what were they like? And what kind of reception did the people who saw the protests have? Um, did they agree with the protest? Were, were they happy to see the G7 there? Or are they happy to see the protesters? Mm, I so uh, actually, my English is not so. Uh, I, I am not so good in, in English speaker, but anyway, so hundreds of people joined our protest to, uh, yesterday, and I, I, uh, I, I, I believe that uh, the uh, protest, uh, pro, uh, protest action uh, today uh, will become a, a little bit uh, bigger because. Uh, Today is uh, Saturday, uh, we, uh, we, weekend. So maybe so more, more people will join our actions. So we we'll start the demonstration at, uh, at 1 p.m. in Hiroshima and uh, march towards the venue of the summit meetings. Yesterday, so we hold the uh, march and, and central in central Hiroshima to show uh, to show our voice. Uh, to the local people, and then today, so we hold the march towards the demonstration and to our strong protest to the G7 leaders. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other and comments? Then, yeah, to okay. the part of the question about what like percent was Japanese ah. versus non-Japanese too. Ah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so, so most of the participant is of course Japanese, but uh, I, I I just near the for foreign delegates, so 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 many <laughs> foreign uh, for foreigners uh, from abroad or live in Japan. So 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 uh, take uh, so many. <laughs> no, of course, most of the uh, protesters is uh, Japanese uh, or living people in living in Japan. Okay. Uh, less, less uh, thank you. Um, there was a question about. Uh, that the U.S. has warships and bases around the world. In fact, the U.S. has 20 times the number of foreign military bases as all other countries combined um, around the world. Um, and they try to make this, they try to normalize this um, uh, with the, the slogans like free waters and so forth. They should have a right for their ships to be anywhere they want. Um, and the question was basically, how can we counter this war, warmongering? Um, it's a very broad question. And uh, let's see if there's any answers for it. And then I might say something about it also. Uh, any comments? What's the best way that we can build the anti-war movement to, pro to, to um, oppose U.S. imperialism? And uh, I think wars around the world. I think when the question is, how do you combat that narrative? You use that narrative and go deeper. So remember the whole slogan of the US military pivot to Asia is promoting a free and a free and open Indo-Pacific. So the next question we should ask is free for whom and open for whom? You know, you look at the reality and, you know, behind the numbers and you see people 
um, in the Philippines, in Indonesia, in Thailand, in so many countries who are becoming impoverished. You are looking at countries uh, like Japan, South Korea, Australia, that we're, we're usually not used to thinking of as, you know, improv impoverished. We're thinking of them of these, you know, the same image that the U.S. likes to make of itself. It's prosperous and democratic. But as Carly just, just laid out, these countries are becoming incredibly um, less democratic than, they, than even sort of the pseudo-democracies they've had this whole time. So when we're saying a free and open Indo-Pacific, how is that getting more free? It might be getting more free for the people in government. It might be getting more free for the foreign corporations who have more access to, you know, foreign investment. You know, that's that's what's open. By open, we mean, you know, Wall Street and other corporations are pouring in investments and capturing. You have, you know, power plants in Thailand that are owned by guys in an office in Manhattan. And therefore they're the ones who have the say over what actually happens with that power plant. A power plant that you know, holds the power for hundreds of people. How is that free and open for the people there? And so when you see why people are rising up, they're rising up because they want their countries, their resources to be free and open for the people together. And that is when, when it's becoming, when the free and open, freedom and openness for the foreign corporations and investors is being challenged, that's when the militarization comes in. That's when we said, oh no, it's it's China, it's Russia, it's North Korea, and it's quote unquote terrorists in, in all the other countries that are um, trying to stifle freedom. That's the justification for militarization. So I think we're gonna keep hearing that. This is to promote, access to these waters for trade question is who's benefiting um joe if i may add to cody's yes, intervention yes I, i'm seeing two approaches here how to counter warm um mongering by the u.s in addition to exposing the the reality of inequalities also the reality of uh, puppet governments that we have um, who allow these military alliances and um, and agreements? Um, I'm I'm speaking, for example, from my point of view in the Philippines, where we have the son of the dictator as the president who visited um, many times already the U.S. Um, that is primarily to rehabilitate the Marcos name, but uh, on the other hand, is to give everything that what well, the Biden administration wants and. Already we have nine military installations, um, U.S. military installations in the Philippines. So uh, the whole archipelago is uh, basically a military, U.S. military base. So I think one is to expose and oppose governments that we are seeing now. I'm sure also in the Kishida administration, is, which is posing to be, you know, a peace advocate and all that, but get, getting to be um, more and more militaristic also in its um, uh, objectives. So the in Asia Pacific, that is one arena of struggle that we have to have, and of course, forging um, solidarity um, among these uh, activists or, or protests or struggles. The other one is to record or to show the past abuses. And I think that's um, what, what Hiroshima is teaching us is that Peace movements have been launched because of these uh, very sad past, um, tragic past, and um, and and the abuses went on even after 1945. Uh, not just the rape of women, prostitution, but also other um, abuses that the U.S. military, not just installations but even the troops, have committed with impunity and even immunity from um, from the rules rules of law. On the shore, on 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 our um, territories. So I think that the two approaches can also show that warmongering is, it's it's simply that it's warmongering and provocation, but it's um, the abuses and the impacts are real. Thank you. I think also what's important is we do something like we're doing here, that we express our own solidarity that we make contacts 
um, and hear the voices of people all around the world, especially in the countries that are victims of um, imperialism, um, and that we keep building building our movement. It's extremely important. And I think ob objective conditions are going to help build our movement. Um, you know, we're, we're starting to see challenges to U.S. hegemony around the world. What's that going to mean in the United States as the U.S. capitalism has to continually expand as capitalism is a system that must continually expand? That means when they can't um, uh, squeeze the global south to the extent that they did before, because the global south might have an alternative, um, they're going to squeeze more of the, the working class in the United States, and there will be a fight back. Um, and when this fight back happens, uh, we need to have uh, a narrative and organizations and a structure um, that can help further that and uh, can build the kind of resistance um, um, among working people here in the United States and around the world, and that can really end, end wars all around the world and end imperialism for good. Uh, so we have to keep on doing the things we're doing, and we have to make international contacts, and we have to work together and express solidarity with each other. Um, uh, there's another question was about a NATO office being opened in Japan. I understand that Japan is now opening a NATO office. North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which part of the North Atlantic is Japan located in? Because I haven't seen it there. I've looked around on the map and I haven't seen it. Um, some of us, including Carly and myself, were at the last NATO conference in Spain um, to protest it, not <laughs> we weren't in, inside. Um, and uh, one of the things they said at that NATO conference was they were making NATO a worldwide organization. Um, and uh, they mentioned their two main targets and enemies in this conflict were going to be Russia and China. Um, and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing it move towards there. And I agree with what Cody said earlier, that they are preparing us for war with China. What an incredible thing that human beings can think of such a thing that could destroy the entire world. Um, so the question was, was there, are, are people aware of the NATO office in Japan? And have there been any protests there? Does anybody have any um, knowledge of that? One thing I'll just say, one of the uh, photographs we showed up during uh, Nakamura Sun's uh, speech uh, was a banner that said, um, oppose the schemes to create an Asian NATO. Um, and so there are definitely people here who are talking about that. This just happened a few weeks ago the first uh, NATO office in a non-NATO country, let alone in, in the Pacific. And I think the fact that Zelensky, President Zelensky of Ukraine, is physically here, I, I, he might still be here with us in Hiroshima, um, goes to show that. Zelensky, what also happened is Zelensky did a tour of all four of the European G7 countries a week ago. That's the UK, France, Germany, and Italy, putting pretty much putting in orders for new weapons leading up to the summit. The UK promised storm shadow cruise missiles. These, these are three times long, long range, longer range missiles than the US has given Ukraine. France promised up to 40,000 Ukrainian troops to be trained by French military in Poland. Germany promised 3 billion euros. That's the biggest military pack, spending package that Germany has given Ukraine yet. And so you're seeing that you know, not only is is Zelensky visiting uh, these NATO countries, he, he very specifically visited the G7 NATO countries, which, by the way, exist in Western Europe. They have this militarized wall of the eight countries that border Russia, Ukraine and Belarus. They call the NATO calls this its quote unquote eastern flank. These are all for, former Soviet bloc countries that are now NATO countries, and they are the most, they are armed to the teeth because they are like a great militarized wall of protection around the G7. 
if the G7 is the brain, NATO is the brawn. And so it's no war, it's no um, surprise, I would think, that, you know, with Japan as part of that brain, they would extend the brawn over across the world. Someone asked, uh, they saw some um, uh, police in the streets uh, around the demonstrations. Um, uh, those of us that protest in the United States sometimes are very conscious of very aggressive policing. Um, as a matter of fact, the last time, when the first time or only time G7 had a meeting in um, the United States was 2012. It was the same time as a NATO meeting in Chicago. And they mobilized a police force that I didn't know existed to, to line the streets and eventually attacked a peaceful demonstration that we had. Um, how have the police been in Japan? Any any understanding? Yeah, Oh, yeah. Okay, so I, I want to ask an uh, impression uh, for uh, the delegate from other countries because uh, for, for us, uh, actually, so, so many police uh, gather here, gather Hiroshima from different areas, for example, from Tokyo, from Osaka, from Kyushu Island, so around, around 200, uh, uh, around 24,000. Uh, police gather, gather Hiroshima from, uh, from all over Japan, but uh, uh, but it uh, uh, but in this case uh, it's not so aggressive in my impression. But uh, of course, so they harass uh, they harass our uh, our demonstration in general. But uh, in my according to my exper experience, uh, uh, we have not so. And the police, uh, police, police is not uh, is not so aggressive di directly, <laughs> and I want to know the impression uh, uh, of other participants, but or, or compare with uh, your countries like that. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think we've gone for uh, about an hour and a quarter. Maybe what we could do is just see if anybody wants to say any one or two or three of you would like to say anything in closing, and then we'll do our online demonstration. So does anybody have any words uh, you'd like to say in closing before we uh, move on to, to open up everybody, uh, open it up for everybody and pull up our signs? I think I will just, uh, Joe, I'll just uh, respond yes. to Nakamura-san's, uh, what is my impression. Um, the, there is an observation, yes, of um, of police being unreasonable for us to just occupy a, 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 a small space of an otherwise locked down town yesterday. So we were asked not to cross that uh, middle white line, but overall um, they they are tolerant because most of our uh, demonstrators are elderly or old people and there is my other observation is there is a gap between the elderly and the young and the youth and and I think we can fill that up with with more um, awareness raising and organizing and all that but one impression is that um, the Japanese people and the international solidarity I witnessed um, here in Japan is really indefatigable um, and I'm very much inspired that we will have more vigorous uh, struggles uh, right now and in the future and more international solidarity. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. What I'm going to do is, is um, try to open it up for people. Um, you'll start seeing people coming on, but I have to do it kind of like one at a time. I'll try to do it very quickly. And um, hopefully you can hold up signs and we can see each other's signs and that will be part of the video. We will take snapshots of that, send it around, and we can be part of the um, uh, solidarity actions that are taking place against the G7. So I'm going to start doing that now. And you should start seeing other people coming in. And uh, um, uh, hold on. I want to talk. 
Can we just call out? Can be heard? Uh, people can be heard. Well, I want to tell you, Russia did not start this war. They lie us out of the uh, U.S. and the imperialist press are always, and of course, Zelensky says Russia started the war. The war has been an attack against the Bolshevik Revolution for 110 years. And you've seen what it's done as far as uh, the, the border countries having been seduced away from support for the Russian Revolution, which is what this whole thing is about. Uh, that... I, I don't see people. Um, uh, I could I could see that I'm getting people on, but I don't see them um, their pictures. So I'm not sure we're going to. My be my, to my name is my name is my, I'm in Berkeley. I'm in Berkeley, California. Can we perhaps have people turn on their videos? If you turn on your video, that might help. And it is, we, um, we, I'm having a little difficult it. time getting everybody on here, but we'll we'll keep on trying. So hold on. We can't do it. You have to invite us to be panelists. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. I guess it's not going to work. I think then. it's in the setting. Uh, where is it? Is it in the it's setting? It's in your Zoom meeting setting. Oh, so I, I can I, can I, I don't know that I can do that from here. Um, maybe, maybe we can have people do it. Let me get a... Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to get as many people on as I can. I'm missing uh, I, most I of think, you so far. I think in the meantime, while we're looking at that, there is a suggestion that Carly had. Which is what? Uh, we can we can maybe do a chat since people have access to the audio. Um, okay. So, uh, get our voices heard over Zoom. Yeah, um, I don't think I have most people on yet, but... Um, I'm trying to get there. I have a great sign. Oh, sorry. I asked you to do these signs and we don't have them, but we can do a chant. Um, I'm trying to get more people on as many as I can. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. We're here. So why don't I've we try here. to start chanting while I get everybody on? We'll have you more and more people coming on. Now. Uh, Carly, you'd probably need to lead us in the chant, though. Great. Well, um, we'll say, I've been waiting to make a comment. And the build up to war. Yeah, can have me on the war, these meetings war. if you don't. You um, off, talk about making seven. comments, and I can't make a comment, so uh, I guess I won't be on these meetings in the future. Can you oh, hear me? Yes. Seven. Junk G7. 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 USA, 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 no I more know. arms, some Ukraine. That's right. Okay, no well, I didn't get everybody on, but okay. we got a lot of us on. Fight um, for socialism. Give us out. Uh, yes. In the build up to war. Asian Pacific. <laughs> so I just want to thank everybody for coming on. Thank the speakers. Um, next time when we do this, I will plan it in advance so I can figure out how to do the settings and we can see people's pictures and signs. But yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Thank let's you keep up the struggle. Well, let's keep up the, the fight. CEO, OD, if we keep it up, we'll, we will win. Ross. Take and care, everyone. Peace and solidarity to everyone. Everyone, solidarity and solidarity and solidarity and international. Solidarity. There are tons solidarity. of our voices. Our voices sound great. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.